A common multiple choice question in medical and surgical exams involves being able to differentiate between an herbs palsy and Klumpke's palsy. My name is Lucy and welcome to another Sutton Brain Hub video. In this session, we will try to understand these two brachial plexus injuries from first principles. A nervous plexus is a network of intercalating nerves that serve a particular area and the brachial plexus is made from the ventral or anterior rami of spinal nerves C5 to T1. Remember, the dorsal rami go backwards, or dorsally, and the ventral rami come anteriorly. The brachial plexus is divided into roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches, or nerves. This can be remembered by the mnemonic, real Texans drink cold beer. The plexus is ultimately divided into the lateral, medial, and posterior cords, which give off the different nerves of the upper limb. Now, an herbs palsy is the eponymous name for a C5 and C6 nerve root lesion. This typically is a result of lateral flexion of the head towards the contralateral shoulder with depression of ipsilateral shoulder producing traction on the plexus and usually occurs during childbirth when a vaginal delivery is particularly difficult. With damage to the C5 and C6 nerve roots, all the nerves distal to the lesion will not be able to transmit their impulses to their target muscles and it is the paralysis or weakness in these muscles that gives us our classic herbs palsy signs. The clinically relevant nerves that are derived from these two roots may be thought of as the ones that are supplied by C5, which are the suprascapular nerve, which supplies supraspinatus and infraspinatus, the musculocutaneous nerve, which supplies biceps and brachialis, the axillary nerve, which supplies deltoid and teres minor, and also the nerves derived from C6, namely the radial nerve, which innervates brachioradialis and supinator, amongst other things. Now, the supraspinatus and the deltoid act in concert to abduct, that's abduct, the arm, so move it away from the midline, as if you were doing a lateral raise in the gym. And without these innervated, the arm will be stuck in the adducted position. The infraspinatus is one of our rotator cuff muscles and acts to externally rotate the shoulder. So without innervation to that muscle, the shoulder will be fixed in internal rotation. Next, the biceps brachii, the brachialis and brachioradialis are three muscles that all act in concert to flex the elbow. So without these, the elbow will be stuck in extension. Finally, the radial nerve innervates supinator and with weakness in this muscle, our pronator muscle, which is innervated by the median nerve, can work relatively unopposed, pulling the forearm into pronation. All of this combined gives us the classic clinical appearance of the waiter's tip position, with the arm adducted, internally rotated, extended at the elbow, and pronated at the wrist. So, that is herbs palsy. Now what about clump keys? Klumpke's palsy is the eponymous name for a C8-T1 nerve root lesion. This is rare in childbirth, but occasionally results from arm presentation, aka the arm emerging from the birth canal first, with subsequent traction or abduction from the baby's trunk. There are three characteristic signs for this palsy. Firstly, the sensory deficit in this brachial plexus injury will follow the C8 and T1 dermatomes, Secondly, the patient will get deficits in the ulnar nerve and the median nerve, since these arise from the medial cord which is derived from C8 and T1 nerve roots. These two nerves in combination travel down into the forearm and hand to supply both the muscles that flex the wrist and the intrinsic muscles of the hand. It is high yield knowledge to know that the recurrent branch of the median nerve supplies the so-called loaf muscles, L-O-A-F, lateral two lumbricals, opponens pollicis, abductor pollicis brevis, and flexor pollicis brevis. The deep branch of the ulnar nerve supplies everything else, like the interossei, the hypothena eminence, and the rest of the lumbricals. With this in mind, in a Klumpke's palsy, where we have median and ulnar nerves not receiving any neuronal signal, our wrist flexors are going to be weak or paralysed altogether. The radial nerve will, unopposed, continue to signal to the extensors, and without opposition from the flexors, the wrist will be pulled into extreme extension. In addition, 
Since the intrinsic hand muscles are paralysed, the hand will take on a characteristic clawed appearance. Without the deep branch of the ulnar nerve receiving signal, the lumbrical muscles cannot serve their function. These are small slips of muscle that act to flex the metacarpal phalangeal joints and extend the interphalangeal joints, almost making an L for lumbricals. The opposite movements will therefore take place, and we will instead see extension of the metacarpophalangeal joints and flexion of the interphalangeal joints, and it is these movements that create what is known as the claw hand. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you found this useful, do consider subscribing to the channel as we continue to explore the mysteries of the human brain and wonderful peripheral nervous system.